Hi everyone and welcome to episode 84 of the Rewarding Property Decisions podcast. So there's been plenty of information flying around in recent times around investment property ownership um, and whether or not it's actually a good time now to buy. Um, we've seen from the ABS in recent times that uh, investor home loans around the country are actually up 35% on this time last year. Uh, and certainly what we're seeing from a values perspective um, in some of the capital cities around the country, it's, it's very strong. So Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane particularly have all been doing very well over the past three or four years and Sydney as well, but probably on a slightly lesser scale from a percentage perspective. Whereas Melbourne's been um, struggling quite considerably and, and really hasn't had a hell of a lot of growth even through the pandemic with the uh, once you take into account the ups and downs. Um, and the majority of properties that that have come onto the market during that period of time in Melbourne have actually been investors selling. So it's almost the reverse of what a lot of other cities are going through. Uh, and those investment properties in most instances are being purchased by owner-occupiers, quite commonly first home buyers. So that's not a bad thing either that we're getting some of those, but it's certainly putting more pressure on the rental market. So what I thought it would be a, a good thing to discuss today is, is is now a good time to actually be adding to your portfolio because there are quite mixed signals going around at the present time. Um, so should you be increasing from one to two properties or if you're in a, a really good position um, from two to three or even three or, or more? So should we be doing it now? And, and the best way I've found to, to look at this is to do the old what, where, when, why, how. So we'll start by having a look at why it's a good thing to own one or more properties if possible. Um, and from an investment perspective, obviously the main reason that we do look to buy investment properties is for financial security and to set your fa your family up for that same for that same reason as well. Um, and we all know from time to time that it is getting harder and harder to actually contribute funds to your super and being able to rely wholly and solely in retirement on super is not going to need to be an easy thing. Now, the other thing that I do need to remind everyone of is that I am absolutely not a financial planner and this shouldn't be taken as financial advice, but these are things that are quite quite well known out in the uh, in the business circles. And I think looking to build wealth in other ways is certainly going to, to help you. And that probably feeds into something that many of you will have heard me say um, in terms of quoting Richard Wakeland many times, and that's buy, hold, never sell, and repeat the process. That's been his philosophy, and it's what our business has certainly been based on. And I think that goes to the point of building a portfolio from one to two, and then hopefully, if you're in a good position, to be able to continue to do that. So what are some of the advantages of actually owning multiple properties rather than just sticking to one? Um, obviously, it means that you've got more than one property adding value to your portfolio and hopefully building new equity. So if you've got more than one, it's it's hopefully going to be building for you at a, at a, greater, at a greater rate. Also, having multiple means that well, having one means that you can then use that one to leverage into the second. So if it's been building your equity, you can take that equity and help it help you get into the market to buy a second, potentially third property down the track. And then once you do get down the track and you get to the point where you are potentially looking to get out of the market and enjoy your retirement, having those two properties may mean that you can sell one, pay down the debt on the other, and then have the income stream coming in for you to live off that potentially, depending upon what other investments you may have going for you at that point of time. The other benefit of having multiple properties is that it, you can diversify. And so you don't have all of your eggs in one basket if you've got multiple properties. Um, I think that's a, a great thing to be able to do. It, it means that you can diversify, not just from a geographical sense, from a location perspective, but also in terms of a property type, style, those sorts of things, which we'll get to um, further down the line in the podcast. And then finally, um, it can also, and we've, we've spoken about this in other podcasts as well recently, around children getting into the market and the want from a Gen Z perspective to get into the market. And by having multiple properties, it gives greater flexibility of being able to assist children to get into the market as well, whether that be by gifting one of the properties to them or using the equity that you've built up or even potentially selling one of them down to then be able to gift the funds in different ways to a child to get help them get into the market. So there's different ways and means, but there are certainly numbers of benefits to get you into that into that market on a on multi-holding basis. The next one is to look at when you should do this. And there's probably two key considerations when taking this into account. The first one being from a personal perspective, um, is it the right time for me to get into the market? So should I be doing it right now given my life circumstances? 
And then the second is market considerations. And is it the right time from a market perspective for me to be entering the property market? So if we look at it from a personal circumstance first, um, what other expenses may you have coming up that you need to take into consideration? So whether it's school fees coming up, whether it might be a change in personal circumstances in that it may not necessarily be expenses, but it could be a reduced income. Perhaps you're having um, another child, and that's certainly an increased expense. Um, but it also may mean that there's a, a reduced income from a partner over a period of time as well. Um, are you at the stage in life where building wealth is a real priority? So if that is the case, then getting into the property market and leveraging to do that may well be the right time. Um, or perhaps you've got an excess income. So you may well have had a, a pay rise at some stage. So that's enabled you to have some extra income to come in. Perhaps you've paid down the home loan um, on your principal place of residence and therefore there's extra funds that could be diverted into a another investment property as well. Um, or if you've been in some ways... Um, benefited from an inheritance. They don't always come at the right time, given that um, it usually means that there may have been a death in the family. But can you use that inheritance to actually get into the market and and, and help you to create that um, uh, financial independence going forward? Then the second one, as we said, is the, the market conditions. Is it the right market conditions at the moment to enter the market? And if we look at that at the, at the present time, Obviously, we, there's a number of factors that, that we consider from a market perspective. The key one at the moment is obviously interest rates. And is that um, the fact that interest rates are probably as high as they've been for a number of years, is that a good or a bad thing? It may well mean, and a lot of the talk at the moment, excuse me, <clears throat> is that interest rates are probably the next movement may well be one more increase, but generally the, the consensus is that they'll probably start to come down. When they start to come down, that may well lead to further um, interest in the property market and people starting to come back in. Generally not immediately, but it's likely to happen at some point in time. <coughs> Certainly got a frog in my throat today. Um, and then if you look at the Melbourne market specifically and how it compares to other capital cities, as I said earlier, the Melbourne market looks, in my opinion, to be quite good value at present time. There's been really strong growth in, in other capital cities. Um, and if you look at where Melbourne sits on a median house price perspective, um, historically compared to where it sits at the moment, uh, there's certainly good signs that at some stage, and I don't think that this is going to be in the short term, but certainly in the medium term, there's really good prospects for Melbourne to recover from the um, the limitations it's had in recent times and hopefully start to really kick. Um, there's also limited competition at the present time, uh, and that's obviously um, taking into account the fact that there isn't a huge amount of growth at the moment, but limited competition means that there's good opportunities to be had, and the supply through the spring market, particularly at the moment in the immediate um, short term, is, is generally pretty good. And if there's a lack of competition and, and pretty good supply, it generally means good buying opportunities. And then finally, um, yields are very strong at the moment. Again, for the same reasons that we've said, the values are held back and haven't been overly strong, but the rental returns have been, um, and, and that is likely to continue. Because we're seeing so many uh, uh, investors leaving the market at the moment, it means that there's greater competition from a tenancy perspective, and it's it's continuing to push rental figures up at, the, at this point in time. So from a market conditions perspective, it probably is generally favorable at the present time. So how do you go about this? How do you go about going from one to two properties? And I think the first thing to do, given that we're talking about one to two, is to review your existing portfolio, whether that's one, two, or three properties. How is your existing property portfolio performing? Um, and why is it at that way? And is there anything you can do about it? So what's driving the performance of your property? Is it been that in Melbourne, perhaps in the past three to five years, the, the market in general hasn't been overly strong and so it's been held back? Or has your property not been performing quite as well because perhaps it needs a bit of um, love given to it and a bit of improvement? Uh, and maybe that will help to lift and to build some equity that way as well. What are the expectations for that property going forward? Is it likely to turn around if it hasn't been performing as well as you would have liked? Is that likely to shift and perhaps you will get some equity into the future? Or is it a proven track record that perhaps this property hasn't been performing and does it mean that perhaps you should focus more on upgrading that one as opposed to adding to your portfolio at that point in time? And then obviously, how much equity have you been able to build up in that? And therefore, what is that going to do to assist you to get into the market, to leverage off that equity you've built up to then hopefully get into the market. So I think the, the key point once you've reviewed that is to then 
seek financial advice. And I think that's really important. Look at the equity that you've got available to you, but also the cash funds that you've also got available to you. And how can that be utilized to get into the property market? Do you have that excess income that we spoke about a little bit earlier that can then be um, attributed towards a new property and hopefully to continue to build that, that wealth going forward? Or do you have some expected um, costs that might be approaching that you need to factor in and therefore perhaps those extra funds that you've got may need to be diverted towards that rather than a new property? Um, what are the potential interest rate movements going forward? And, and really factoring that in, you'll have heard Stuart Weems is a guest on here and Stuart speaks regularly about making sure that you've got a, a bit of a buffer over existing um, interest rate levels to make sure that if there are movements, you factor that in um, and you can you don't have to go and sell a property. You've, you've made allowances for those extra costs that might be coming your way. And then the other really important thing is to look at your ownership structure. How is, is it going to be best for you? Is it going to be to have it in an individual name, in a, in a trust, in both you know, perhaps two parties' names? Should it be in, um, held more in one person's name than the other? All those sorts of things need to be factored into before you launch headlong into buying another property. And then how is that the existing or the, the new purchase going to fit in with your existing portfolio in terms of making sure that it complements the existing portfolio? That's what you want to do. And that leads me into um, the where and the what, which are in some ways have got similarities to them because we're talking now more about the actual new purchase itself. And that really leads me to diversification being a really important part of, of adding to a property portfolio. I think that's a, a key aspect. Um, and you really, as I said, you want it to diversify away from the existing property, but also to complement the existing property. What this does is it, by adding and diversifying away from the existing property, is to reduce the risk that you may well have. Um, by diversifying, the, you'll you'll see that and the, the current Melbourne property market or the current Australian property market is a really good example of this. Property markets don't move in a uniform manner. It's not across the board. It's not as though every market is going to be moving at the same rate. So having diversification is really important. Now, sometimes that might well be going to different cities or different um, capitals around the country. Sometimes it, you can still get diversification within a city and looking at it from a geographical sense and making sure that you're picking different locations um, so that if one of those areas is flat for whatever reason, another may well have a bit of a kick for, for a different reason as well. So taking all of that into account is really, really important when you're considering um, the position that you want to be in. If you do decide to go to um, a different state, uh, that, that there's other factors that you need to play that can really help from that diversification perspective. So for instance, land tax is a big one at the moment in Victoria, um, and it's a, it's a really it's having a significant impact on people's decision making around in, investing in property. So there's a lot lesser concerns in other cities, and so therefore we're seeing a lot more investment in property in those those locations. Um, landlord requirements again can be a really there's, there can be differing expectations of differing requirements that, that state governments can put on. So for again, using Melbourne as the example, there's um, proposals coming in that as of October 2025, there's going to be increased expectations around air, air conditioning, around insulation, around draft proofing, those sorts of things of, of properties that will need to be factored in, in terms of costs. So these are the sorts of things that, that can help from a diversification from a geographical and a location perspective. So you can do it going from city to city, but you can still get diversification within a, within a city and looking at different um, geographical areas as well. But then it leads to the next way to diversify and that's with the what. So that's more looking at the actual property itself. Um, so looking at the property type, the style of property, the condition that that property is in, in terms of being able to add value that way as well. And it's really important when you start to look at the type of property to understand the expectations of the buyer within that suburb, because what one buyer may expect in one suburb is not going to be the same in another. And so for property types, certain property types work well in some suburbs, but they don't in others. And a good example of that might be, for instance, warehouse apartments in Collingwood are really, really popular. They're well regarded because there's some fantastic old warehouse buildings that have had some great renovations and, and refurbs done on them. And they've really factored in and, and taken into account the older style, the high ceilings, the big windows, and they can maximize that. 
But a lot of buyers, for instance, where they may not be looking for that type of property in a suburb like, say, Camberwell, where it's a more middle ring suburb, there might be some old industrial buildings there, but that's really not the market that people are going to want that type of property. So understanding that is a really important part of this as well. So there's a number of factors there to take into account when you're looking at going from one to two. And I had this con same conversation with a client of ours um, uh, in recent times. I, um, they were, they came to us wanting to buy a property in, it was around the early, it was actually the early part of 2020. So it was just after the COVID pandemic had kicked in. There was a lot of hesitation and a lot of people not wanting to buy property. We had a lot of people pull back rightly at that time because it was a very uncertain period of time. But this um, person was able to come to us and say, look, I understand that there's a bit of uncertainty. I've got funds. I'm ready to go. I'd like to buy something now. I don't want to stick my neck out and go and spend over a million dollars and buy a house, but I'm happy to buy an apartment in a really good location and build some wealth that way. So what we did was go and buy a, um, a, a one-bedroom apartment in, um, in East Melbourne. Um, and it was very affordable because the apartment market at the time, it hasn't been strong for an extended period of time now, but it was even more conservative then because people were really concerned about being locked up in apartments. Now, we got a really good one-bedroom apartment with a courtyard at that stage, and it needed some work. So by the time um, this person took possession, which was sort of mid-year, they were able to settle on that property and in between lockdowns do a little bit of work and improve it and then were able, was able to lease the property out. Now, it didn't set any records because the rental market was quite weak at the time, but it was able to be leased out in a fairly short space of time um, and they've bedded that property down. And over time, for a number of reasons, it's actually started to build some equity for them. So obviously we purchased it really well because it was at the right time to be buying and the demand was, was very weak for similar type properties. The market's moved a little bit since then, not significantly, but there's been some certainly a, a little bit of um, wealth creation there as well. The works that they carried out built equity a little bit further again. So that's helped in that regard as well. And now the strong rental return, because it's really kicked into gear and there's some strong demand for this type of property uh, and there's not a lot of competition for it. So the rental return has moved significantly. So that's enabled this, this client of ours to be in a position to now be able to go again. And what they want to do is, again, buy now to diversify their portfolio. So now they're in a fortunate position where they've built a bit of wealth. They're in a stronger financial position themselves personally as well. So now they want to buy a little house. Um, and they're in a position at the moment because the housing market is quite affordable um, to be able to buy a, a single fronted cottage terrace house for somewhere between sort of 950 and 1.2, 1.3 million dollars. And that's going to really be um, an achievable outcome at the moment. Uh, and they've really had the focus and they this person really does uh, look up to Warren Buffett, lives by the Warren Buffett, um, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. So they've followed that, that logic and they're really wanting to get into the market now. And it's a, it is a really good time and they're going to put themselves in a position they want to be able to buy something this time that is um, needing a little bit of work to again rely on building equity that way as well. Um, and then hopefully continue to build their portfolio. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an understanding with uh, today's podcast on, on some of the options and some of the considerations to make if you are looking to build on an existing portfolio. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can take out of that if you're looking to buy your first investment property as well. So thanks for joining me for episode 84 of the Rewarding Property Decisions podcast. As always, please feel free to share the podcast far and wide with friends, family, work colleagues, and anyone else who may have an interest in property. And otherwise, if you'd like further information, please visit our website, wakeland.com.au. Otherwise, we wish you all the best with your property decisions.